and thank you for joining us for the third annual Global Summit on Innovations in Patient-Centered Kidney Care, a partnership event presented by the American Association of Kidney Patients and the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. My name is Diana Kleins, and I'm the Executive Director for the American Association of Kidney Patients. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Michelle Tarver, Director of Patient Science and Engagement with the Center for Devices and Radiological Health at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for a session on International Kidney Innovations Consortium, Policymakers, Practitioners, and Patients Respond. As we enter into the decade of the kidney, the AKP is leading efforts in the emerging global consortium for kidney innovation that is being led by patient consumers around the world who are rejecting status quo kidney care. We are driving a patient-centered culture where kidney patients as consumers of healthcare are at the table and influencing decisions that are being made about them because no longer will decisions be made without them. This growing global network of patient organizations will be working closely with their government and industry to inspire change. We respect all professionals who have elevated and embraced not only patients, but patients as healthcare consumers. And both Dr. Tarver and Ms. Salati will speak directly to the importance and unmistakable value of patient engagement in both federal agencies and industry. I'd now like to turn it over to Dr. Tarver. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you the work we're doing at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health on incorporating the patient perspective in the medical device evaluation. I'm Michelle Tarver, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Office of Strategic Partnerships and Technology Innovation at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Patients are at the heart of everything we do. In fact, it is the first word of our vision statement that patients in the U.S. have access to high quality, safe and effective medical devices of public health importance first in the world. Now, patients are the first word because they are the most important person in the equation. In fact, patient input is useful across the total product life cycle. Patients help inform the needs and in fact, direct where there are technologies absent that meet those needs. Patients can also give us insights in how the device is designed, as well as inform how the trial is designed so that it captures outcomes that are important to patients, as well as measuring these, those outcomes in a way that allows for patients to be retained in the trial and give good quality data. Patients also lend their perspective on how they value the benefits and risks associated with the medical device and its alternative treatment options. And those perspectives are important in our regulatory decision-making process. Patients also give us insights on how we can communicate those benefits and risks back to other patients in a way that they can understand and can inform their healthcare decision-making. And then lastly, patients are part of our boots on the ground surveillance system, giving us insights into how a device is performing once it's in the general use. Our CDRH Patient Science and Engagement Program is inspired by patients and driven by science. It was formed a few years ago solely with the purpose to make sure our entire center understands the patient's perspectives and proactively incorporates them into all our decisions and regulatory activities where it's appropriate. The three pillars that undergird this overarching goal is consistent regulatory review when, it's in, when patient information is included in a medical device submission, fostering a culture of patient engagement, and working to optimize the research roadmap, creating evidence that supports the incorporation of structured, well-defined patient input into regulatory decision-making. Let's focus for a moment on how we do consistent regulatory review. Before I start talking about that, I want to level set on how patient input is incorporated in regulatory efforts specifically. We talk about patient engagement and people use that term quite loosely, but our draft definition is that patient engagement are those intentional, meaningful interactions with patients that provide opportunities for us to mutually learn and to effectively collaborate across the total product life cycle. It is a relationship but it's a relationship that supports the development of the science of patient input. 
In fact, there are many different forms of the science of patient input, but two I'd like to highlight here are patient reported outcomes, which is any report of the status of a patient's health condition that comes directly from the patient without interpretation of the patient's response by a clinician or anyone else. It's how they feel, how they function, and how they survive in life. Patient preference information is different than that. This is how patients view the value or the importance of the benefits and the risks of a particular treatment or its alternatives and how they make a decision about which treatment they would choose. This information also can be collected in a structured and well-defined way that can impact regulatory work. The ways that we disclose um, what's important to FDA and, and transmit those recommendations is through guidance processes. We have put forth many guidance documents that help to detail how patient input can be used in our efforts. But one I'd like to highlight is a draft guidance that we issued last year on how patient reported outcomes can be selected, developed, modified, and adapted for use in medical device evaluation. It's almost a best principles guide that talks about some of the important elements for people to consider if they're going to include it in their development pipeline. We know that by clear and consistent communication of the uh, expectations that FDA has, we're more likely to have an impact on the pipeline across the total product life cycle. One different mechanism that we use is the Medical Device Development Tool Program, where we qualify patient-reported outcome measures as well as other tools to create efficiency in our process, as well as minimize the uncertainty in the regulatory review process for industry. We currently have three qualified instruments in the program, and a number of other patient-reported outcome measures are under review in various different product areas. We encourage developers to submit to this program because we do know that it has benefits across many different devices, particularly those innovative technologies. Some of our efforts have had regulatory impacts. In fact, we have seen because of our clear guidance documents that industry is more likely to do patient studies. And one of them includes the patient preference information studies. In fact, there are 24 industry sponsored studies that have been completed or in the pipeline. And those studies have expanded our labeled indication for medical devices, as well as informed the design of a clinical trial by helping to set the performance targets. Patient reported outcomes have also had an impact in our regulatory work with over 50% of studies with clinical data, um, including a patient reported outcome measure. The only way we're able to accomplish this, as I alluded to earlier, is by fostering a culture of patient engagement, both within the walls of CDRH and outside. We have put on our website uh, an, a video that details the ways in which patients can engage with our center. And in fact, it features one of uh, uh, AAKP's own, uh, Paul Conway. This gives some insights to patients that we are open to hearing directly from patients about their experiences. We also ha have a very formal mechanism called the Patient Engagement Advisory Committee. This committee is the only one like it at the agency. It is comprised of diverse patients, caregivers, and patient advocates. And our goal with this committee is to hear formal recommendations regarding general matters related to medical devices. We have had a number of peak meetings over the years, touching on areas such as the design and conduct of clinical trials, uh, post-market data safety surveillance, how we communicate around cybersecurity, as well as artificial intelligence and machine learning. We encourage you to visit our website and stay tuned for the upcoming meeting this year on a post-market topic that I think will be of interest to many of you. Our peak meeting doesn't just end in the discussion but it also leads to tangible outcomes. One such outcome was from a theme we heard during our meeting in 2017 on clinical trials. There was a lot of discussion around the omission of certain patients from trials, particularly patients from different racial and ethnic backgrounds. And so we put together with our Office of Minority Health and Health Equity a video to encourage underrepresented populations to participate in medical device clinical trials. We encourage you to view this video. 
We also drafted a guidance document on how patients can engage in the design and conduct of medical device studies. The draft guidance was posted and we are working on final finalizing this guidance. This is our way of debunking some myths that may have been um, perceived about patient engagement, as well as encouraging industry and other stakeholders to include the patients in the process. From our peak meeting in 2019, we discussed cybersecurity. And from that meeting, we decided to put forward a white paper that talks about best practices on how one might communicate about cybersecurity vulnerabilities. We also committed to launching a mini series on cybersecurity hygiene. And we encourage you to visit our websites and, and check for updates on this effort. So I mentioned some of the work we've done to externally talk about policy as well as efforts to uh, impact medical devices. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the internal resources we have and efforts we've undertaken to include the patient's voice. The Patient and Caregiver Connection is a mechanism that our staff can use to hear from individual patients about what it's like to live with their specific condition, interact with the medical devices that treat that condition, as well as hear about current issues or concerns facing that patient community. We currently have 18 partners that we reach out to depending on the topic and the need of our review staff. I'd like to share with you a few examples in which members of our Patient and Caregiver Connection have lent their insights to our work. Right before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we had a workshop on how artificial intelligence is being used in radiological imaging. And we heard from three patients and their caregiver about how this technology may impact their quality of life. The insights they shared were valuable to industry and the regulators. And we learned very much from hearing what their concerns are about that technology, as well as the way in which it might be deployed. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we reached out to members of the American Association of Kidney Patients and specifically asked them about challenges they may be having managing their kidney disease. We learned some valuable information that really did help inform the work we were doing on addressing shortages with respect to medical devices. So I want to personally thank all of you who contributed and participated. So our work doesn't start with our regulatory efforts, but it extends beyond that and how we might optimize research to benefit the entire healthcare ecosystem. And we don't do that in a vacuum. We do that collaboratively with patients and other stakeholders domestically as well as across the globe. On this slide, you can see work that we've been doing in various different disease areas, but our work is, is designed to de-risk the inclusion of patients' perspectives by taking on that risk ourselves at the center. We also are hoping that we can plant seeds that can lead to innovative technologies, landing in the lives of patients and positively impacting their health. You can see one of our projects that we are doing with the Kidney Health Initiative is focused on wearable technologies to treat kidney disease and how patients weigh the benefits and risks associated with a potential therapy that uses this modality. We also are interested in ensuring that all voices are included in the conversation. So we are doing studies looking at diverse populations, diverse with respect to their age. So we're doing some pediatric studies, diverse with respect to gender, which you saw on the prior slide, as well as this one, some projects in that space, and diverse in terms of the racial and ethnic backgrounds of the patients, because we know that for kidney disease, many of the patients are of African descent, and many of them are non-English speaking. So making sure that we meet their needs, understand their perspectives is critical in the work we do. That brings me to the last point that I'd like to mention. And that is collaborative communities, which is one of our center's strategic priorities. Collaborative communities are continuing forums where both public and private sector members proactively work together to achieve common objectives and outcomes, to solve shared challenges, and leverage collective opportunities in an environment of trust, respect, empathy, and openness. We are currently participating as a member in over 10 collaborative communities, some of which I'm not able to share with you the details today, and many of those communities, as you can see by the highlighting in orange, have patient participation as well. The ones that are italicized are looking for patient participation. So very clearly, 
all of our collaborative partners recognize the importance of patient voice. These collaborative efforts include domestic as well as international partners. I encourage you to visit our website where you can find more information about this effort. So to summarize, patients can directly impact medical device evaluation, whether it's by engaging with us, by contributing their outcomes measured in a structured and well-defined way, by sharing with us their preferences or contributing data that's being collected from digital health technologies and other innovative ways of measuring their experience. It can have a significant impact on our work. As we journey from concept to care, I wanna highlight a couple of points. The first is that the medical device ecosystem is shifting. In fact, CDRH has made significant progress in advancing the science of patient input, integrating that science into the work that we do, and making interactions with patients part of our daily business culture. Understanding the patient's perspective and proactively incorporating them into the medical device evaluation process will lead to promotion and protection of public health. We are working to explore the novel applications of patient input through our regulatory science efforts, because we know that there are more emerging methods and technologies that can afford more opportunities to integrate the patient perspective seamlessly into the evaluation of medical technologies. We encourage that working together, journeying together in that pre-competitive space across the healthcare ecosystem, and that will help us seamlessly integrate the patients and their voice in all aspects of health and wellness. We have a number of resources available and we encourage you to visit our websites for various information, as well as if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to our mailboxes. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and hope that you also decide to engage with CDRH in the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tarver, for a wonderful presentation. I would now like to pose a few questions. Through your role at the FDA, you have had a tremendous amount of personal interaction with patients from many disease groups, including, of course, kidney patients. As a medical doctor, researcher, and U.S. government official, can you tell us how the stories and insights of patients you have met have impacted you professionally and as a person every day? Well, I've been a caregiver, a patient, and a provider. And I can tell you that I've seen people go through difficult times and challenging healthcare situations. And that process teaches you a number of lessons. The first is to empathize, seek to understand, as well as look for solutions. And if we can develop solutions together that work for your life, for your values, then we've accomplished something. But I've also learned that we aren't always successful, but it doesn't mean we don't keep trying. And so with that, as a regulator, I am looking for ways in which we can expand the footprint of patients in the process, how we can incorporate their voice, but incorporate it in a meaningful way. It's not always successful. Even the research projects that we do are not always successful in accomplishing the goal that we'd like to accomplish. But it gives us insights and it gives us a step forward in the right direction of making this more of how we all do business in healthcare. And now a final question for you, Dr. Tarver. The Global Summit audience has expanded rapidly over the past several years and now includes researchers, regulators, and patients worldwide. As a U.S. regulatory official who is actively encouraging companies to include patient insights across the product development life cycle, what message do you have for researchers, regulators, and patients considering the inclusion of patient insight data in their countries? Well, I think the first thing, as I alluded to in my presentation, is the importance of thinking about the patient's input across the total product life cycle. There is not one point only in which the patient's voice should be included. Because medical devices are being developed for people in various countries, what those unmet needs are in terms of how the disease may manifest in their lives may vary. And so asking the patients that will actually be using that device may be important. I think it's also important to think about how do you communicate to patients and measure the outcomes that are important to patients. 
the language that's used, the cultural references that are important, as well as the, the features of their life um, vary from country to country. So one person's measurement in one country may not reflect the experience of patients in other countries. So including the voices of the patients that are using that device in their respective locations is critical. As well as the post-market experience, care is different from country to country. And so including patients in various countries in the process of understanding the post-market surveillance once the device is in general use, is gonna be critical too. So as I said, across the total product life cycle, patients from all backgrounds in various countries should be considered.